All right, all right, all right. Another week, another Centre Circle podcast. Um, episode 80. That's right. I'm getting better in it. You Every are. week, I'm going to get to the point where I don't need to even reference key. I will just know um, the episode number. I should just write it down before. That would probably be, probably be best. Um, as usual, you've got myself, John, Adrian, and Keith. How you doing, boys? I'm good, you know. Yeah, can't good. complain. Yeah? Prem's back. Yeah, I know. International weekend is a bit... Mm. But it's, it's still football. You shouldn't complain. The Prem's back. Um, this week, we have a very, very special guest. Um, William Afori, uh, football agent, is joining us today. How you doing, bro? I'm good, thank you. Thank you for joining us. I know you're a busy man. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. <laughs> so thanks yeah, for making the time. Uh, William is a, is a football agent, as I already mentioned, who represents uh, uh, probably most notably, and for Keith, because he's a Liverpool fan, um, mm-hmm. Diva Corrigi, who is, uh, what, what do you call him again? A cult legend, that's the word you use. Cult, cult hero. Cult, cult hero. hero. Yes. <laughs> at, at Liverpool. Yes, cult saying. hero yeah. at, at, at Liverpool. Vital goals. Um, but, William, I'll let you introduce yourself. You can do it bit more justice than I can. Yeah, so, first of all, thanks for, for having me here, guys. Um, so, my name is Wilma Forey. I'm 30 years old. Football agent now for three years. A former ex-professional football player. Um, I'm based in Belgium, uh, but my roots is from Ghana. So, uh, both of my parents were born in Ghana, and I was born in Belgium, so... Uh, but yeah, that's in a in a nutshell, uh, a little bit who I am. Interesting. Yeah, got, there's a there's a couple of points in that we're gonna yeah, we're gonna, I didn't, <laughs> we're gonna touch on a bit. I didn't have to mention Ghana. Though, <laughs> yeah, okay. no, no, it's fine. But I will mention. I will not mention Afcon. Oh, I just did. Sorry, sorry. Our friend Chris is here as well. Don't worry. You as well. We'll talk. You've always got map for Nigeria. Don't worry. Don't worry. But but um but yeah. So interesting. That I think it would be good to just touch on. So you say you've been an agent for three years, but you were an ex professional, and this is a route we've seen. Uh, quite a few players go into. They either become a coach, they go on TV and pretend to be experts, yeah. um, but they also, you know, go into the world of, of becoming an agent. So can you tell us a little bit more about how you kind of um, got your start in the game? What led from you transitioning from being a pro player into becoming an agent? Um, if I think about my story, actually mm. then I have to go back to like beginning days, like when I was a, a child. Mm. Um so I played at my local team. Uh, I started there when I was six. Uh, and then when I was eight, I got scouted by Genk, oh, wow. which is one of the biggest clubs, I would say, uh, yeah. in, in Belgium. Um, so I joined Genk at the age of eight, and I stayed at Genk at the old U teams until the first team. So I stayed at Genk until I was 20. Um, and then I played two years in the Netherlands. Yep. Uh, I went back to Belgium, played in like second and third division in Belgium. Mm. And when I stopped playing in third division in Belgium, uh, I was no longer professional. Like in Belgium, I would say like the first division and the second division is professional. Mm. From the third division, it's like semi pro. Semi pro, yeah. And maybe you have like one, two teams that are professional, but not a lot. Um, so at that point, I was like, mm, okay, I don't know if I will get back in the professional circuit. So maybe I should start thinking also about what I would do like after my career. Yeah. Um, and at that point, I was like, okay, if I'm good enough, then a professional team will pick me up. If not, then I'm already, like, establishing my my new uh, career path um, towards something else. Yeah, yeah. So at that time, because um, as a as a player, I especially know a lot of, of football players, and I was part of a, a good gen- generation also uh, in Genk and in Belgian football in, in general. Um, so through having that network and those people, there were a couple of agents that reached out to me and were like, oh, you don't want to work as an agent because you're young. Um, you have an understanding of the game. You play it yourself uh, and you seem like a, a small guy. So maybe you could join us and help us like get players and uh, okay. and, and like guide them a little bit. Mm. And at that point, I was like, yeah, why not? Um, it's always interesting. I want to stay in football for sure. Like football is my life. I'm a, I'm a football freak. Um, so that seemed like something interesting to do on one side and the same on the other side I was still playing football and seeing like how things would develop um and I did that for two years um I started playing at the at the lower club lower division club when I was 24 yeah and I did that for two years also working two years for different agencies and then when I got 26 like two two and a half years later somewhere in 2020 during 
the start of, uh, of or during COVID, yeah. actually. Um, I got actually in, um, um, like an offer from a professional team, uh, which is Pato Asia. They play in second division okay. now in Belgium. At the same time, I had the chance to start my own agency. So then it was so like... So you almost, so you got to a point where you were pro. Yeah. You went semi-pro. Yeah. Started looking into kind of a post playing career because you're thinking, okay, this is maybe the tail end of my career. And then opportunity comes back to yeah. go back to pro <laughs> yeah. or almost start to really solidify what you'd been working on. Yeah, exactly. Wow. So what, that, what timing? Yeah, that was, oh, uh, that was a very difficult decision because I love to play football myself. Mm. Um, and as a child, it was always my ambition to, to become pro and, and, and stay pro for as, as long as possible. Um, so when you get that chance back to to become a professional, um, but at the same time he was establishing something on on the business side, and at that age also COVID hit. Um, so I started thinking a little bit about my future, and in the end, the opportunity I got to like really start my own agency. Um, yeah, uh, after some weeks of thinking, uh, I took that route. And okay, um, now so we're what? Here. So just to delve into that a little bit more, I guess, what 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 kind of thought process did you go through? Because to uh, you said only a few weeks, so it's not a long time, right? So you've been, yeah. you've been playing football at a good level since you were eight. You have an opportunity to extend a bit longer. And, and you know, you weren't old for a footballer. So I don't know how long the contract was, was or what they were offering you, but you could say for at least a year, yeah. you can go back and be a pro again. And that could yeah. maybe lead to other things. So... The level of conviction or faith you had, you know, what can you give us an idea of what made you say, you know what, I'm gonna leave that 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 dream behind and start the new dream? Um, I think that has more to do with uh purpose. Yeah. Um, because my I love football, that's that's for sure. But I think when I started playing football, I want to play football and be an inspiration for other people. Um, so I thought like if I can have I'll be a, a good football player. I'll have a big platform. If I have yeah. a big platform, I can influence people and do okay. something with um, the influence I, I have as a, as a footballer and as a person for the society. Um, but after having the chance to like build my own agency, I realized that I have to listen to God's way and mm. God's way and not my, uh, mm. or, or my own. Um, maybe in my head, it's like, oh, um, the only way I can uh, have a voice in society for, for other people being inspirations, being a football player. Um, but on, on the other side, I was like, I can do the same with being an agent. Yeah. And especially in Belgium, we don't have a lot of, of black agents mm. uh, or, or agents of, of African, with African uh, roots. Yeah, yeah. Um, you could maybe say the same across Europe, to be honest. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Um, so for me to have that opportunity in, in, in Belgium, um and then inspire the youth and other people uh, in that way um and even for a longer period of time also um as a football player your career maybe will finish at yeah after after 30 35 mm. maybe if you're lucky uh, uh, 40 <laughs> um but as an agent you can do that until who knows yeah of course so i had to think more long term yeah. um and in that way of thinking, I was like, okay, let me go uh, and start the agency now. Amazing. So I mean, I've got, I just want to ask, like, kind of going back a little bit, what position did you play? Oh. <laughs> I just, I'm just intrigued. Mm. Like, what position did you play? And kind of attached to that question, who was, like, the biggest player that we know that you've played with? And that's gone really far. Like, just a bit random, yeah. but I just thought, yeah. uh, just interested. Um, as a kid, like I think we all start as forwards. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we all wanna wanna score goals yep. and, and, and and dribble. So when I played at my local club, I played like a, a left winger, okay. I would say. Um, but when I got to Gank in the in the first years, under nine, under under ten, I started playing as a left back. Okay. Um, and then starting from under eleven, I played as a centre back. Oh. Um, so I played as a centre back from under 11 until under 16. And like in under 16, they started seeing that I wouldn't reach like 190 or 185 as a, as a central defender. Mm. So they slowly started shifting me left back and sometimes as a box-to-box midfielder. Okay. Um, 
so from that point on, I think when I got to the first team in Gank when I was 17, uh, that was as a left back. Okay. So uh, I started playing as a left back and then throughout my career, I'm mostly playing left back, sometimes um, uh, left winger or as a, as a box-to-box midfielder. But my main position is, is left back and also left footed. So. Okay. Oh, okay, okay. One of those. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the rare yeah. breed. The rare breed. And I guess to your follow-up question, uh, Adrian, um, you know, who's probably the most, the player you've played with that will be most recognised or anyone that you've played with has seen up close? Um, I would say my my group age, the like most famous player or known player now would be uh, uh, Dennis Pratt, who played for Leicester. Okay. Oh, yes, yes, yeah, yes, yeah, yes, yeah, yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, he's the same age as me, also a good friend of mine. Uh, we played for six, seven years together mm. uh, until he went to Anderlecht. Yeah. Um, and also you had Divock. Yeah. Uh, of course, he's one year younger, but he started playing with my team since even on, on the 11 or on the 12, so okay. quite early. Okay. Mm. Um, and then you had uh, Yannick Ferreira Carrasco, who um, played for Atletico Madrid. Okay. Um, he was one year older yeah. uh, than me, but sometimes I played one year above, so I played with him. And then when I got to the first team, uh, like I was still super, super young, um, there were, was Kevin De Bruyne. So oh, I think okay. that's the... That's and, I, and I know it's a cliche question, but even at that point, you seeing him up close, we always like, this guy's gonna gonna make it. Because sometimes people say, I didn't was see it, it, you know, <laughs> I didn't see it. Or sometimes they're like, no, I knew from the moment I see him. And I'm like, did you, did you really? But, you know, as soon as you saw him, did you think this guy's gonna go to the top? Yeah, because um, I joined the first team uh, after they got the title in Belgium. Mm. Um and Kevin De Bruyne was one of the key players, okay. together with Thibaut Courtois, also mm, yeah. uh, um, of, of that gang, getting them the, the championship. Mm. Um, and back at the time, I was 17 years old, so um, he was 20 years old. Yeah. Uh, so pulling that off is yeah. just as wow. remarkable yeah. as, as that already. Um, and I remember the first um, game I played with the first team was like on the, on the fan day against uh, Lyon. Mm. And I was, I was, as, as I was only like 17 years old, mm. um, I thought that I would get like maybe two, three minutes, five minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or 85th minute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Something, something like that. Yeah. Um, so in my head, I was, I was prepping for those couple of minutes uh, to, to make my debut. And then um, before the game, we saw like paper sheets uh, with formation. And um, I had to play the start of the second half. Yeah. Huh? Um, so for me coming from under 17s I skipped under 19 and, and under 23s mm-hmm. to go to first team and then play against Lyon which in that time was like a, a big big team mm. um, we plays like Pjanic and, and Brion um, Lisandro Lopez mm-hmm. so yeah, you can understand. I was like <laughs> shivering, <laughs> <laughs> nervous. Yeah, yeah. I was, I was so so nervous. Um, but the good thing is, the coach had like mixed up a little bit the the younger mm-hmm. players with the uh, more experienced ones. Yeah. Um, and Kevin was playing as a left winger, so I was playing as a left back. Okay. Um, and um, I think people could tell that I was like very very nervous. Mm. Um, and I remember just before going on the pitch, um, he told me like, oh, okay, like I can see you're a little bit nervous. Um, if there's anything, just pass me the ball. Even if I have like someone in, in my back, yeah, yeah. just pass it. I'll help you out. Oh, wow. um, and I was like, well, okay, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll <laughs> appreciate that. that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Appreciate that. that. That Did that help? It probably helped, didn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. a lot, a lot. Yeah. Um, because to be honest, I remember I gave him some some sloppy passes, uh, <laughs> yeah. some some passes that normally you can not do anything with. Or yeah, yeah. it brings someone else in, in trouble. Mm. But the way he handled that and then just made every bad pass a good pass or, wow. or just never lost the ball no matter the circumstances was just different. Like yeah. was Love was crazy. Man. And after that that game, I was like, this this place is something else. Amazing. So a, a, a bit to, to Adrian's point, I'm going to take it back a little bit. So talk about, you know, your Ghanaian heritage and you joining that club at eight years old. You know, there's always a thing that's talked about um, 
probably a bit more wider in the black community, but definitely in the in families of African descent, especially when they come to Europe. How how supportive were your were your parents with you joining the football club at eight years old and that being a big part of your life? Because you know you always hear the stories of being told, go and read your book. You know, football is just that thing over there. But the time and commitment to be in that club at that age of eight, you know, were your parents super bought in or was it an older sibling? What 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 was the driver there? Was or was it something that you, you it wasn't it wasn't a big deal and we'll just see if you could do it. <laughs> Um, no, I think it was a big deal because I'm the oldest of four. Okay. Um, and to be honest, when I was like three, four, five years old, I, I like football, but mm. nothing like crazy. Mm. Uh, I play a little bit of football at school and that's it. Um, and one day my dad just told me like, take your bag. I have a bag for you. Yeah. You're going to play football. You're joining uh, the local club. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> yeah. And that was it. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's nice, I, I didn't even have a choice. Yeah, you yeah, were yeah. like, yeah. you you will go and, and, and play football. It's almost like the equivalent of dropping you in a swimming pool and seeing yeah, you swim. Yeah, and, and that's yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. it. So, um, I remember that game. I'll never forget. We lost like 17-1. Or something. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it was the, the worst, worst start ever yeah, of yeah. our football career. Um, but since that day, I got the love for football, actually mm. more and more and more. Um, and from that point, I just really started liking it. Um, and my dad was like very supportive, but mm. my mom was like, school, 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 yeah, school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so by the time I got like six or seven, Genk already asked my parents if I would join the academy. Mm. But at that time, my parents didn't even have a car. Mm. And my mom was like, nah, like it's too far. and like more trainings, like three times, three, four times a week. Wow. So Even at like, six, seven years old? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And Genk, we saw training uh, from on the seven, on the eight, like three times a week. Wow. Uh, and then a game in the weekend on Sunday. Mm. Uh, so my mom was like, no, we're going to we'll take the focus on your school away and let's not do that. And at that time, I didn't have a car and Genk didn't have like a um, taxi system. Yeah. 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 To pick up players. Mm. So I just stayed at my at my local club for two more years, mm. and then uh, uh, after two years, gang came back, and then they were like, "Yeah, we have like a, a bus system now where we can pick you up." And then my dad looked at my mom like, "I just just, just yeah. let him go." Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. The excuse now, <laughs> no yeah, yeah, yeah. now, we will be all right. Yeah. Um, and then from that point, I, I joined gang. My mom was like, "Okay," but each year she was like, "Oh, how are your grades? And and how, mm. how are you like behaving in school?" And mm. For her, that was the most important yeah, part. Yeah. Like, keep the balance. Yeah, yeah to yeah. keep the balance. She didn't really care if I would become a football player or not. She just wanted to have me, like, to, to have a good education mm. um, and just be a good person. That's it. But it was yeah. more my dad who was, like, uh, yeah, a football. My boy is going to be a footballer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Fantastic, yeah. fantastic. So, you know, if we fast forward, um, you've come through the youth system, the professional... I guess as a professional, you'd have dealt with agents in some shape or form. Yeah, yeah. you made a few transfers. You've now been an agent for a few years now. What would you say is, from your experience as a player dealing with agents and now being an agent, what would you say is some of the biggest changes over that time? Um, oh, I would say the amount of agents now. Yeah. <laughs> really? Uh, Everyone's an agent? Everyone is an agent uh, nowadays. Back in my days... Um, there wasn't really like a lot of agents mm. even like circulating around games, like youth games. It wasn't really like that because even when I signed my first deal at Gank, I didn't even have a, an agent. Mm. So my dad basically negotiated that for me. Um, and that's that. Whilst now, if you look back, because I was playing national team of Belgium on the 17th okay. when I signed that contract. Now it's impossible for a player playing national team yep. to not have an agent or sign a, a contract just with his with his dad or mm. his mom or mm. the, their parents. Like that's a little bit um, like not realistic anymore. Yeah. Um, so I would say like that would be the the biggest change uh, the amount of agents. Um, and why do you think that is? Is that because well, I guess one obvious thing is it's more lucrative now, right? More people playing the game. Yeah. Kids are getting signed. Everyone is on the hunt for the next wonder kid and Chelsea's buying all of them. No, I'm joking. But, you know, um, there's that. But also, are there any other factors? Is it easier to be an agent now? You know, what what else do you think has led to the explosion in the number of, of agents? I think just seeing that um, football has become like 
uh, a big, big business yeah. Uh, yeah. in all countries, all over the world. Uh, it has become, I could say maybe, definitely in Europe, the biggest, biggest sport mm-hmm. uh, yeah. uh, that there is. Um, and after a while, as you see, like the business side also growing uh, in football, I think more people want to take control um, about contracts and how things will, will go, transfers, and especially parents um, want to take more control over their own child. Yeah. Um, and I think that's where the influence of having more people trying to become an agent mm-hmm. um, started. Although now FIFA um, has implied that um, before in Belgium, you didn't need needed a license to yeah. be an agent. Okay. But now you do. Okay. So um, that has led to uh, uh, a decrease of, of agents. Because yeah. uh, now there's certain paperwork, there's yeah. certain standards you have to meet. Yeah, yeah that usually deters. Yeah, that usually exactly. deters people. Sorry, Jay, can I just jump in? Sorry. You said uh, under-17 international now wouldn't have, rep- or they would have representation. Um, so what age do you think agents are kind of looking at kids now to kind of sign them up? Is it like under 14, under 15? Like what's, what's the age where the agent's saying, I want to be ahead of the curve with this particular yeah, yeah, talent. Uh, normally, for me personally, I would say um, if a player starts playing for under fifteen, um, then I will be like, okay, let me let me like uh, push for this player or let me try and sign this player because that's the year that the national teams uh, start. So right. under fifteen is the first year, and that's also the year where they will sign if they're good enough. Uh, they will sign their first contract. Okay. So um, for me personally, from from under fifteen on, I will like push or try to sign players. But nowadays, to be honest, uh, I see agents working with, or yeah, like on uh, be behind behind the scenes with eleven, twelve year olds, thirteen mm-hmm. years old. Like there's there's literally no no limit anymore. Okay. Yeah, I can imagine it as well because look at look at social media now. Yeah. You know? some players are eleven, twelve. They build a big followings. Yeah. Their parents are editing clips every week. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Probably not even there. They probably pay someone to edit the clips yeah. every week. The stick talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's even players that have such a huge following um, because of uh, what the work that their parents are doing. It's almost a modern version of, you know, the David Beckham documentary. Mm-hmm. And his dad said he was sending the tapes to all the clubs. Yeah. It's almost the modern, yeah, the modern version of, of, of that, isn't it? Um, and I think we've talked about this a few times uh, on the pod, you know, the use of data, stats. Um, lots of clubs are using AI now. Has that bled into your side of the game as an agent? Are you using more data to uh, assess players or to to target players to support what you're seeing, you know, what we call the eye test? Uh, or are you using any AI or anything like that? Or is it still very much getting on a plane, getting, on the, getting in the car and going to see that player play? Uh, for me personally, I... I like or prefer to see the player play. Mm. I think there's nothing better than uh, to see with your own eyes. Mm. Uh, no matter how much data uh, you can assemble or get, uh, for me, it's like if you can see the player, mm. you can see certain stuff um, that data won't see. Mm. However, now we're living in a, in a time where uh, a lot of clubs use a lot of data also. Mm-hmm. Um, so... Even for my for my own clients, if if they have good data, I can use their data to, um, um, like push it to to a team or convince the team more to take that play instead yeah. of another one. Yeah, of course I'll uh, yeah. I'll do that. So you have to have that combination of, um, what I feel or what I see, yeah. but also like data wise to bring reports to scouts or clubs. And is that increasing over time? Are you using more and more data? As the time goes on, or yeah. it varies? Yeah, definitely. Because um, <laughs> even if a player is fast, um, and scouts will be like, oh, he's a fast player. Mm-hmm. And then if I can say like, oh, he can hit 35, 36, 37 kilometers an hour, mm-hmm. and I have the data of that, mm-hmm. and I can provide it to And that to makes scouts. him X amount, the fifth quickest player yeah. in the league, or whatever, yeah. and all that stuff. Yeah, Exactly. And, yeah. and they look at that, and then they can go to their representatives and be like we have to buy this play because mm-hmm. here's the data <laughs> look it's crazy. crazy so that's how it how it's changed a little bit interesting interesting is, is there too much data for me personally yeah yeah i, I think we are at the peak of of using data yeah. um and even using certain um um like measures that for me doesn't really have to do anything with 
Like what? Oof. I hope yeah. you say the one that I'm thinking. Like what? what? <laughs> Give me an example of a stat that you don't like. Um, of a stat that I don't like. Or you don't uh, think it's useful. Let's not say don't like, but you don't think it's as useful as they, as they, as they make it. Be. Yeah. Oh, they begin with X. <laughs> <laughs> what? That's that's definitely uh, <laughs> uh, uh, one of them. Yeah, um, XG, XG, <laughs> yeah. expected goals, expected and, assists now. And then because you you can look at a game and be like, oh, they they didn't stand a chance. And then afterwards you hear like, oh, the XG was like four or something. <laughs> and then it's like, yeah, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah, I agree. Um, it's, it's crazy. And expected assists is another one. Yeah. There's expected goals conceded as well, isn't there? There's defense. There's like yeah. defensive yeah. expected yeah, yeah. measurements as well. Yeah. Um, I saw one today where they, I need to read it again, but they basically mix the XG with like a period of time. So then they could try, they're trying to In put a status group. to what burst of time. You're going to like Yeah, score. you were affecting the game or it, I'm reading it, <laughs> you know, and I'm like, do I need to have a PhD to understand to to understand this? So the logic is there. I understand they're trying to make the game better, but I just think there's just some things you can't boil into a number. No, um, especially back in the back in the days with midfields that were not that physical. For mm. example, they still excelled at a at a amazing Pillar. level. Um, <laughs> and now it's like, oh, you have to reach um, that amount of uh, kilometers. Uh, you have to run like this. Um, you have to kick the ball a certain amount of times like this. While before we didn't look at that, and and that type of football brought like one of the best footballs also. And yeah, yeah. I mean, there's no football, so. there's no statistic for how good your touch is. Right? No, there's, there's no statistic for yeah. how well you receive the ball. And, yeah. and these are the things that that make a difference, right? Largely, yeah, yeah, yeah in the exactly. Game and, because sometimes uh, someone can be like, "Oh, he gave." 90 passes. Mm. But if, if from those 90 passes, sideways. 90 were sideways or, or, or backwards, backwards yeah. Yeah, what, what are we speaking about? Yeah, so. yeah. No, I agree. I agree. So then, I, I think the the it's a good time to talk to you. And the reason why I say that is you've not been out of the game that long as a player, but you've been an agent long enough where actually, you know, you can form a really decent view. So, We've talked about what's maybe changed in the time you've been doing it and from a player. So what does the future look like? Because I feel like as a fan, we almost, I didn't want to, I don't want to say sleepwalked, but the whole free transfer thing, right? So it came to a point where clubs, I feel like clubs and, and the media almost vilified some players if they waited yeah. for a free transfer to then get a better contract for themselves or not let the club outprice them. But now, it's kind of the norm, right? We, yeah. we, players are um, either running out of contracts or waiting to get that that leverage. Um, you know, we've got the the three maestros at, at, at Liverpool. Everyone's debating, you know, Trent, Van Dijk, um, Salah, they're going to yeah. sign, etc. Arsenal were rubbish at it for years. All our players got to the last, yeah. see, um, <laughs> to the last um, no, season and they said, oh, we're going. See you later. Yeah. Um, but now it's the norm. So do you think we're going to get to a point where actually just being in the free transfer is, is, is going to become even more of the norm? And if that's the case, how do you think that's going to affect the way contracts are going to set up in the first place? Because if I know I'm going to lose you and you're just going to walk walk away, but you're going to leave and I'm not going to recoup anything at the end of the three years, that might influence what I offer you in the first place. Yeah, yeah that's true. I think um, in terms of free, free, free transfers... Mm. Four or five years ago, if you were a free player at, at the end of your contract, um, you were like in a big, big position. Mm. Like you had the luxury to ask for more wages uh, um, and more teams being interested because they don't have to pay a transfer fee for you. Nowadays, I wouldn't really say that's in your benefit anymore yeah. um, because we have shifted also in the business or in the, in, in the, in the football world to clubs buying younger players. Yes. Uh, instead of plays like 27 plus uh, mm -hmm. years old. Um, so now as a free agent, if you're like, oh, I want to double my wages, mm -hmm. and then the club will look at you and it will be like, mm, okay, we can give him these type of wages, like high wages, but we could also go for someone of 80, 90, 20 years old mm -hmm. that we can bet on. And then if he does well, we could sell him for 
X amount of, yeah. of, of money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and an interesting case in, or interesting cases in, in that regard were like Rabiot, um, his case this summer. Uh, Rabiot. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, from Juventus. Mm. Yeah. Um, who went to Marseille. Yeah. Uh, and um, yeah, I think he lowered his wages uh, uh, a lot. Um, and, and that's an interesting case because people all talked as much about his agent. And if you don't know who Rabiot's agent is, it's his mother, right? Uh, they, they talked almost as much about her <laughs> and how she negotiates and some of the stories as they did about him. And I always wonder actually, is her reputation preceding her? And is that making it uh, uh, a bit more difficult? Um, because everyone always talks about she drives a hard bargain, she always gets what she wants. But I guess that's a great example t- to your point. Well, that's great. You're France international, you're Rabiot, blah, blah, blah. But the game is the game. Yeah. yeah. And I don't think that maybe at the beginning of that, they thought, no disrespect to the club, mm. that's where he was going to end up playing. Yeah. I don't think like Marseille was his um, first choice. First choice. Yeah. Um, but like, if that situation was five years ago, mm. it would have been different. Yeah. Mm. Back then, at the time, clubs were more investing also in players that had, were more proven. Mm. Um, a bit and of a, a brand name. Yeah, and a, and a brand name. Mm. Whilst now it's more like, oh, if we can get a younger player uh, uh, for less and, and we can develop him and, and sell him, we would prefer to do that over. Um, a player that has more experience. Yeah, yeah. Um, and in terms of of his his mother being his agent, I don't know her, so yeah. that's difficult to say something uh, uh, about her or about that situation. But I think more in 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 general, even with the pie and, and and other players, the pie going to to Brazil. Brazil yeah. Um, maybe that also wasn't his, his his first choice. I don't know. Um, but I just I've I've seen over the years that being a free agent is not that. Beneficial uh, um, anymore or that specific. Um, you just have to perform well, and if then you are free agent, of course, it's in your benefit. But if you have like a uh, a normal season or something like that, it's not really that clubs will be like, "Oh, you're free," and that's why we will take you. Yeah. So I got so I just was thinking of the pie in, in Brazil and the little PR campaign mm. of him having his hair done in the club. It, it looked good, fun dog. I, I was like, that was, <laughs> I was like, yeah, that and, I, and I, I rate. To be honest. The way uh, Memphis Depay has almost done his career and the way he is, he strikes me as someone that he's going to do what he wants to do. So a lot of the rules around, oh, you know, when you're not playing, you shouldn't do this. He doesn't care. You know, he does his music, he drives his cars, he does his dressing, like his fashion and all that stuff. All the stuff that, let's be honest, a lot of young players, especially young black players, they get a lot of criticism for. Mm. So when I heard he was going to Brazil, I thought, "Yeah, yeah. That makes sense for you. Like, <laughs> yeah, I, I've seen yeah. something. I'm gonna make a decision. That I'm gonna go. You see, he's scoring goals. Um, he looks like he's enjoying I, it. Yeah, well. and I like I like the fact that he he did that, right? Yeah, and that that point is interesting because if you take example of like a couple of players recently who was on a free, so like Lingard and De Gea, mm-hmm. everyone was kind of like, why didn't why are people why they not been signed? Yeah, like, right. surely for the, for their talent. But now you saying that it kind of explains why they might not have been looked at. As soon as they were yeah. available for a free transfer. And yeah. it's also exactly. about what you were asking for because, again, Lingard was leaving Man United at that point, wasn't he? Was it Nottingham Forest? Sorry, not Nottingham Forest. Yeah, Nottingham yeah. Forest, yeah. And then, again, this is where the media, obviously, people in the game know the real story about his wages or whatever. But you went to Nottingham Forest, it was widely reported you went there on big wages, whatever the number was. Mm. Didn't really play. So it would be interesting to understand was he asking for a number that reflected the fact that actually, I'm okay. not played, but. I wasn't a success there. Or oh. I'm just in Lingard. I played on my United. Won FA Cup. I've got England claps. Blah, 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 blah. So it goes back to your point about if you if you think because you're free, you're going to get this wage. No, I'm all right, actually. I'm mm. going to, you know. And then the De Gea took ages. Yeah, he's at like Fiorentina now. Yeah, yeah, yeah whole season. Yeah. yeah, he did play for a whole season. Yeah, he? he's at Fiorentina now, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah, yeah he's at Fiorentina doing well. now. Yeah, he's doing yeah. pretty well. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So it would be interesting again. We know he was one of the highest earners at my United. Did he bring down his expectations low enough for someone to sign him and maybe a year was enough time for either someone to be desperate enough to pay what he wanted or, or for him to be like you know what I'm not been earning I'm, he's not short of money but yeah. I've not been earning for a year let me get back playing and yeah he's he's yeah. he's doing well but it's to your point yeah five six seven years ago yeah someone would have scooped up the hair yeah, yeah. 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 especially yeah. in the Italian market mm. uh, Juventus was like a specialist in, in yeah, they were. Oh, yeah. yeah 
Oof. That was almost like a, the, yeah. Mo, the, the yeah. how they operated. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, people come to the end. They, they would look at free players like one year before the end of their contract and already like push, <laughs> pushing for a deal if they really like the player. Yeah. Because Pogba went there. Did Pogba go down to free? No, they, no. they bought from United. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. paid for him. Did they pay for him? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. It, was, it wasn't a huge amount though, was it? No, because no. that was around the time. The youth, yeah. youth. And then I think they bought someone mm. and he said, no, I'm off. I'm not, I'm not yeah. having this. And Fergie wasn't, wasn't happy with that. Um, and, and then the Chelsea contracts. So again, these seven-year, eight-year contracts, nine-year contracts, from your point of view, you know, if this was one of your players, is this a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Or actually, past a certain point, contracts are contracts. You know, what, what do you think about these long style con- accounting <laughs> contracts? <laughs> <laughs> I think yeah, it's 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 beneficial to the club mm. um, to have more control over over the play and and to have power for the time that he will fully explode or or do very very mm. well. Mm. Um, but for me, as an agent, it doesn't really uh, harm me. It depends on the project. Mm. Depends really, yeah, uh, sorry. When I said as an agent, I mean for your player. So as a oh, representative yeah. of a player, is there something you'd be wary of or it just depends from player to player? Uh, I would say it depends from player to player, yeah. case to case. Yeah, okay. Um, cool. Of course, I wouldn't be immediately open to sign an eight-year or nine-year <laughs> deal for, <laughs> yeah. for, for my client. Yeah. Because some of those contracts were seven years, weren't yeah. they? And should, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. And Cole Palmer just extended his by a year or two. Yeah, as well. yeah I saw that Nicholas Jackson is now on a contract yeah. until 2033. Yeah, yeah, yeah something like that. That's, that's super, super long. <laughs> <laughs> um, but maybe in, in, in his case, mm. uh, and I don't know what he has agreed with Chelsea, mm. that could be also very, very beneficial uh, for him. And he, mm. for him, and he can be like very protected because of that, that contract. Yeah, very or, true. Um, like Chelsea making a big uh, investment in him for all these years, which maybe would mean that he would be like the number one striker also yeah, for a long yeah, time. Yeah. So it depends a little bit from player to player and case to case. Um, but yeah, I will always say like a four or five year contract is already quite long mm-hmm. and is a little bit the norm. Um, but I think Chelsea tried to shift that also to balance their books yeah, of course, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. a little better. Yeah. So if that works for the for the club and also for for the player then why not mm. but i don't think everyone would would mm. go for that i um, just find it interesting in football i feel like when someone does something that no one else has done it's immediately bad especially in yeah. england mm. you know the gary nevilles and the roy Keynes and all these guys of the world will be like yeah. that's not good we don't like that and then someone does it for long enough and i i reckon more clubs are going to start doing it yeah, I think more clubs, especially with the younger players, I think more clubs are gonna we're gonna start hearing. I mean, they've they've put in some rules around it now. I don't know the exact particulars of it, but I think that clubs are gonna start offering much much longer contracts. And it's always the case someone does something new that these guys haven't experienced or don't have understanding of in their career time. It's a bad thing. Uh-huh. And over time, oh well, actually, actually it makes sense. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. So it'll be interesting. Yeah, if, definitely. If a Southford player. Comes up with a severe contract. I'm gonna act. I'm gonna yeah, act. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is what you said. This is what you said. So yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I don't have any view on it. I think it was quite clever from a business point of view to to do that. Um, my only worry is sometimes with players, it, we just talked about them, the way the market's going. You know, the big. I, I think the days of the big, big mega transfers on a regular basis are probably over. Mm. Some very, very special. People that, and then we could probably name them on these two hands. So if you get to a point where in the old days you might be coming to the end of your contract, you know it's not working for me, it's not working for you. I'll see you later. Now we get to that point. There's still four years left of the contract, uh-huh. three years left of the contract. So I actually think it's probably less beneficial for the players than it is um, more tilted towards the club. So that's the only thing I'm worried about. But if you're Nicholas Jackson or someone and the trajectory keeps going, then it's win-win. You'll ever get. A renewal with more money, or someone will come in and pay the money. Chelsea win, you win, and that's fine. But if not everyone could be Nicholas Jackson, not everyone could be Cole Palmer, and they've signed twenty something players, right? Mm. So that's that's where I'm I'm watching and seeing. Like, actually, what is that? What is that going to mean? So it was interesting to hear your your your, your take on it. Um, but swinging back round to to kind of your your kind of Ghanaian Ghanaian heritage, 
players coming from Africa to Europe is not a new thing, right? We've had that for for a long time. But again, now with 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 data, with the internet, with a lot more things happening on social media, etc. Are you seeing any change in how that transition is happening? Or is it pretty much the same? Um, or are you seeing that actually it's becoming a bit more fairer? Because we hear all these stories about, you know, the scams and people come to yeah. Europe, no one comes to get them and someone's paid money to someone, yeah. etc. Are you seeing things getting a bit better in terms of African players making it to, to, to the European leagues? Yeah, I, I definitely think uh, that's getting better. Okay. Um, even when I was at, at, at Gank, I saw Wilfred and Didi mm. uh, coming in in the academy. Mm. Um, and he was well taken, taken care of uh, from, from the first day. So no like crazy stuff or, mm. or anything like that. Um, so I definitely think that has been been better. Also because there's more structure in, in Africa uh, um, itself also. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because back in the days with the uh, Academy of um, Jean-Marc Guillou, um, from where Yayo Touré was in mm. and Polo Touré and Jovinho and all these um, Ivory Coast players. Mm. Um, that was like one of the only or, or first well-known academies in, in Africa that yeah. was structured and where clubs and from Europe would go to and take players. Mm. And then from other academies that were not that, that structured, um, things would get go wrong mm-hmm. with agents trying to scam players and Maybe clubs are also trying to profit from that situation. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, but now in Africa, we also have like much more organization and a much better structure, um, which protects the players uh, uh, a lot and uh, much better than before. And then the way they go to Europe is also in a, in a better way um, from the first day. Okay. So then that's why we see less scams. And also, um, they are putting Africa on the map. Uh, and that's also the reason why a lot of uh, African players are now coming, coming to Europe yeah, because of yeah. the players mm-hmm. before that have done so, so, so well. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and a lot of those players have gone back and opened their own academies. You yeah. know, Kony, Okocha back in Nigeria, mm-hmm. et cetera, exactly. et cetera. Exactly. So helped, yeah. that definitely helped for um, for getting African players to, to Europe in a, in a good way, in mm-hmm. a good, transparent way. So um, I think even Right to Dream in Ghana is doing super, super super well, uh, working with Nordsjælland in, uh, in, in Denmark. Um, so I think that's also a, a great example of uh, how uh, African players are getting a lot of chances for growing uh, into Europe. Fantastic. And I guess, is that is that an avenue for yourself? Are you, is that a market that you know, you're signing players from or looking to sign players from? Uh, yeah. Are you concentrating more in Europe or what's... what's... No, I, I, I like to be uh, strategic and, mm. and do everything uh, step by step mm. and, and to not get too ahead of myself. But Africa is, is, is yeah, of course, one of uh, one of the targets I have in my head to recruit players and, and get them to, uh, to Europe. Uh, yeah, for sure. I think uh, there's still a lot of... of um, more work that we could do in, in Africa. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, they are doing a, a great job right now, but I think there's more that we can do. And as an Asian and with African roots and heritage, uh, I feel like, of course, I need to play my part in, in, in that also and create more opportunities for, for people over there. So, amazing, um, amazing. And I guess lastly, sort of the, the future, what the future looks like. Um, obviously, the women's game is growing rapidly. Um, we were discussing off, off mic beforehand, you know, America seems to be ahead of the curve in that respect. Um, you know, their, their women's national team is, is, to be honest, doing better than the men's for a long time. Um, uh, the coverage and the support for the women's game there. Obviously, we've got the Women's Super League in the in the UK, more coverage, we've got on Sky, etc. Mm. So I get, again, from an agent's point of view, um, uh, is there a plan or strategy to... To again, to Keith's point, almost kind of get ahead of the curve or step in there and, and give more women's players the the right level of representation, or actually, is that part of the game? You need to be in that part of the game and know how that that area works, or it doesn't matter. Is that you know? um, I would say it's um, it's a bit of of the same as in the men's. It's mm-hmm. just that women's football, um, um, for some reasons, has hasn't been that big mm. as, as, as men football yeah. but it's growing a lot right now uh, even in Belgium it's really uh, it's really growing and getting more professional um, and then getting better contracts and better staff and, and um, uh, surroundings 
So uh, I think that's a good thing. And I think uh, women's football is, is definitely developing uh, in, the, in the right direction. Um, and I think also more people are now looking into, into women's football, even going to the games. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. I think yeah. if you look at the amount of people going to the stadium for, for women's football yep. has increased massively. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Comparison yeah. with yeah. a couple of years ago. Mm. So I think that's definitely a, a, a sport that will keep on, on growing. And for me as an agent, um, I would like also to represent uh, uh, women in, yeah. uh, in football. Um, so for now, I don't have any, any women uh, in, the, in the agency, but that's definitely something that I want to look into uh, over the past, in the upcoming uh, weeks, months, or, or years, because I think uh, uh, also in that way you can develop people um, mm -hmm. and have an influence yeah, uh, exactly. um, and build a brand. Yeah. So, uh, so, yeah. Yeah, cool, cool. Um, a bit wider. There's been lots of talk. It's died down a little bit recently, mm. but I'm sure it will come back, especially when the Club World Cup comes back. Uh, I saw a stat yesterday that as of today or tomorrow, I think between now and the end of the year, there's only two days without a professional football match being played that is in the Premier League, FA Cup, Carabao Cup, et cetera, et cetera. The number of games being played, what is your view on it? Is it as uh, excessive as the players are complaining about? Is it a necessary evil? What's your view on the number of games? And it looks like it's only going to increase. For me personally, I think uh, we reached a point where um, enough is enough. Okay. Um, I can understand the players uh, complaining about it because it's not even uh, only the seniors that have to play a lot of games. Mm. It's even now the youth players that are doing a crazy amount of games if you mm. compare it with five or ten years ago. Mm. Um, for example, I have a client that is playing um, for the second team in Bruges. Mm. So they play professional football in the second, in the second uh, division of Belgium. He plays for the national team of Belgium and he plays youth league. So he's basically playing... For three teams. Yeah, for three teams. And uh, he's playing games each three days and he's 17 years old. Wow. And even today, he's not starting because the club needed to protect him mm. uh, physically because yeah. he plays for the national team. I think three games in space of a week yeah uh, eight days and then you come back to your club and you have to play again yeah, yeah, yeah. so even on on a on a youth level mm. it's 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 getting a little bit uh, i hadn't thought much. about that actually. Yeah, i was only thinking about first team football yeah. i hadn't thought about the youth team yeah because yeah. he i think since the start of the season has been playing each three days almost crazy um, and because of that also a lot of traveling not being able to properly go to school anymore mm. and it's, for me, it's getting a little bit um, out of hand. So what do you think the solution is? We've had things talk about, you know, m maximizing minutes. You know, saying, oh, well, you can only play X amount of minutes within Z time period or whatever. From your experience of playing and now representing players, what, what obviously, you don't have all the answers, but what do you think is uh, the type of solution we should be looking at? Um, I don't think they need to change the game on itself. So I hope they won't get games to 80 minutes or 70 minutes <laughs> or crazy breaks or anything like that. Uh, I hope they just keep it to, to normal. Um, but for example, Champions League platform right now, um, if I'm not completely incorrect, um, is more games uh, yeah. now? Yeah. yeah, I think it's, there's it's three good. or four more games to get to the final. Something yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah, so it's a format like that that where they can reduce just mm. a, a couple of games, um, even maybe with Nations League to reduce like a couple of games. And we as as fans, as spectators, can enjoy football also on a on a better uh, level. Yeah. But sometimes maybe I think watching games each two days or each three days doesn't really get your full, full attention anymore. Yeah. It makes it a little bit harder. Yeah. Um, I'll be honest, as a fan, I'm a bit of a hypocrite. As a fan, I like watching the top teams more regularly. So you're right, in the Champions League, there are some Champions League games I'm never going to watch. Yeah. I'll be honest, because I don't want to see those teams. Yeah. But, you know, Liverpool, City, Milan, Juventus, all these games, it, all these things. I'm old enough to remember when, and we talk about this every day, when the Champions League was just the champion of the number two team. Mm. So there were times <laughs> when it got to the later, you're waiting... Mm two weeks between games or yeah, yeah, yeah. it's two or three months between stages. And I used to be like, oh, 
why could it be more? So there's an element of me, I, I agree with you, there's an element that is too much. But there's a part of me, if you said from Sunday to Saturday, <laughs> every day I can watch a match with a top team, I yeah. probably wouldn't complain. I'm being honest, yeah. I probably wouldn't complain. And I kind of think of the Qatar World Cup. Yeah. I love that tournament because right. it was like, from in the morning, it was four, the, four games, four games, yeah. four games a day in the group stages. You know, in my office, you just turned off the light. <laughs> <laughs> and we just watching yeah, the next game, and, that, and we're doing bets as well. We're yeah, like, yeah. yeah. So I do enjoy like more yeah. football as well. And I think that's the challenge because people aren't voting with their feet. They're not playing more of these games, and viewership is like, well, from what I can see, viewership is dropping. Or subscription is dropping. You know, the YouTube views. People are still buying boots, etc. So that's where. I agree with your point wholeheartedly, but I have to say, it's selfish. I, as a fan, am I now saying, oh, it's too much. I'm turning it on and I'm talking to my friends about it and we're coming here to record about it. And uh, So it's just like, what is that? I think they almost have to not ignore that, but they almost have to, to your point, give people, um, if we ruin the players, there's no game for people like me to watch everything. Yeah. Exactly. Basically. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And even with like the amount of injuries now where, uh, uh, coming through in, 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 in a lot of clubs. Mm. I think that's also due to uh, the amount of games uh, mm. being played. Um, and if the players are not really enjoying anymore, then yeah, we, we are getting to a point where uh, we, we have to start listening to them uh, mm. to produce like or watch more top, top football also. Yeah, but what do you say to the point that... I say to the point, I made this point. I'm saying like someone else. <laughs> but, but I made this point here where, you know, as a whole, wages have inflated. And, and, and I know at the top end of the game, we see all the big mega wages. That doesn't mean so, you know, the majority of professionals don't get those mega wages. But if you look at overall, player wages have inflated a lot. Mm -hmm. These, a lot of the clubs and the, uh, and the associations will say, if we don't do this stuff, we're not going to be able to afford to keep paying the, paying the wages that we're paying um, to keep up with the talent, etc. What, what, what do you, what do you say to to that argument? I don't really think that, in my opinion, that's a, a fair argument. I think that all even players uh, openly state out that if they were earn less money mm. to play less less games, they would do it. Mm, yeah. Um, yeah. and I think FIFA and football, as in a in general, was making a lot of money yeah. Yeah. a lot of different ways. Not only the football itself, but marketing-wise yeah. also. Yeah. Well, look at the whole thing with FIFA, the game, right? Look at yeah. all of that stuff. And yeah. Yeah. they've got a different route now to, to maybe leverage the brand yeah. a bit more. <laughs> exactly. Uh, use those exactly. words, yeah. So there's a big, big amount of, 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 of money now flowing in, in and out of, mm. of, of football. Um, to reduce just the, the games... Uh, just a little bit, yeah. uh, maybe like five, ten games less less a season. I think the FIFA could manage that yeah. and still earn a lot of money. Yeah. So yeah. I think it's it's doable. Uh, I think so they could yeah. do more than that. And I think, you know, if you're a top player, you play for City, yeah, or Barca or Real, and you get fired a lot, you could end up playing sixty five club games a season, right? And you stay free of injury. Then add your national team, some of these players must be getting close to 80 games yeah. a season. Yeah. 80, 85 uh, games a season. And then now we've got the Club World Cup. Yeah. Which is basically, I think you were telling me, is... It's a, it's a, it's a mini World Cup. Yeah, because it's over four weeks, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. yeah. <sighs> it is. That's great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's... For me, it's, I think it's a little bit too much. Yeah. It's a little bit too much. So, uh, I hope they, they do something uh, about it because... Even the players are now forcing it more mm. and more and more. And uh, there's some people that, that have been saying like, oh, but they earn X amount of money. They so should so just uh, uh, do it. But yeah, then I say first do what they do and then you can... You <laughs> can. Yeah, and that's why I, that's why I wanted to ask you because as a... You know, we've all run around a pitch in our local park, but it's not the same as, to your point, going uh, to train, et cetera. Yeah. So, yeah, the yeah, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. yeah, the mental side. So it was just interesting to hear from someone who's actually played the game and who also now is, you know, looking after players mm. to, to, to give us a little bit of reality to that, to that aspect. Because even when you talk to players... You know, we all we all growing up with people who've managed to make it pro, etc. They will say work. Oh, I'm going to work. They don't say oh, I'm going to. I'm going to work. Yeah. yeah. So, 
you know, in any job where you feel like your work is all consuming, etc. Even the big CEOs, whoever that get paid millions, they feel it's it. A, <laughs> they feel uh, it too. Uh, you know, levels. and your hamstring doesn't know about <laughs> how many grand you earned in the week. <laughs> when, true. When you're running the right wing in the 89th yeah. minute, right? So, was, yeah, exactly. There was something I wanted to ask with that because of your journey from being a professional footballer to becoming an agent. How many players on your books have you had to speak to about changing their position to convince them to get another contract? So, you know, like a team might come and say, I like Dom, but I see him as a a centre-back now. But he's used to be playing a centre-mid. But, you know, people, we all got our egos, right? So some might say, no, I'm a centre-mid and I only want to play centre-mid. Have you had to convince a player to consider changing position and and take that approach just um, to kind of, Guarantee a contract for them to play on for another two years. Um, only if it's beneficial for him, also in the long run. Mm-hmm. So if it means that, for example, if if a club comes in and tells a, um, a centre mid to become a central defender, mm. um, and I think about it, and I'm like, yeah, actually, for the the length of his career, it would be better to now play in, in that position, and mm-hmm. he would reach like maybe a higher level in that position than a centre mid, yeah. then I would obviously tell him. Yeah. But if it was just for to force a transfer, yeah. um, I would never do that because yeah. in the end, you'll get backfired yeah, 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 uh, yeah. either way. Yeah. And me, do you see that, to, to Adrian's point, is more when someone's in the game. But do you see that also more with some of your younger players? Because you always hear these stories. Oh, and the youth team, like you said, the youth team was this position. But now, I mean, this. I'm guessing that, do you, are you having that conversation more when people are transitioning into the pro get like, you know, going from youth to pro, are you having that kind of positional conversation a bit more? Yeah, because myself, I'm a, I'm a football freak. So um, me, myself, if I have, for example, a left back, I will start looking like, mm, maybe he's better on, on the left wing or maybe as a, as a midfielder or a holding midfielder or central defender. So, um, and now you players also, they have a much bigger voice than, than before. Uh-huh. When I was younger, it was just like, oh, you're going to play in that position. Why? Because I say so. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's it. That's it. Yeah. No, no discussion or anything. Mm. But now, um, yeah, you players have also such a big, big platform already, some mm. of them, at a young age. Um, so they also have a voice. Um, so you can um, have more conversations with them uh, in regards of position, uh, and they will tell you why they feel like they want to stay in that position, and I can tell them also with my experience why, in in the in the long term, I see them at a, at a different position. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you have that conversation, and they feel and they know that you are sp- that you know what you're speaking about, they'll listen. Yeah, yeah. and mm-hmm. it will be like, okay, I'll I'll give it a try. Especially as an agent who's actually played the game. Because some agents, they never played the Definitely game at that played. level. Yeah. So that's where you can have that, you know, that I've been where you are. Yeah, yeah. 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 Because yeah. for myself, I had to make that transition from a centre-back to, to a left-back. Yeah. And at that point, I didn't really like it. Mm. Um, but in the end, in the in the long run, that was more beneficial for me. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I can use that um, example to my own players yeah. uh, yeah. On, a, on a good level. So yeah. then they are like, oh, yeah. He's making a, a point. I, I get. I can see where it's coming from. Mm. So that definitely helps to uh, have certain conversations with them. Okay. Okay. And I guess just uh, you know, conscious of time. Um, so again, as fans, we see the media have made uh, a term for some agents. You know, the so-called super agents. So we had uh, Minerarola, who represented Pogba, and, and I think Ibrahimovic and other players who who, who passed away. Um, in, in the recent few years, you got someone like Pini Zahavi, uh, what's another name that George Mendes, all yeah. these players. Do, are those type of are those agents of those profile of that profile? Are they what effects do they have, if any, on the industry? Because I do remember a time where, well, in the UK we did have we had Sky Andrew and mm. and a few other agents, but I, I always feel like agents weren't as much in the spotlight, maybe. And then they start to become personalities in their own right. Is that, a, you know, what effect does that have on the industry? Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Does it not really matter? Um, it depends a little bit. As the 
place or having a bit bigger platform mm. uh, right now. Even coaches uh, yeah. have a bigger platform. They have Instagram now. They can use TikTok. Um, Jose and, uses Jose Marino uses Instagram yeah. very well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, very yeah. well. Yeah. Exactly how he markets himself yeah. uh, is also uh, special. So if everyone, everything and everyone is growing in, 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 in the football industry, automatically ages will also start growing and have like a, a bigger brand uh, uh, or a bigger name and get more influence also in, in the game. So if as an agent, as a super agent, you control um, 10, 15, 20 or X amount of, of world-class players, you'll have a big influence uh, on the football market, not only with clubs, but also like even marketing-wise. Mm. Um, you can start maybe pushing your player a little bit more somewhere than um, where another agent with a player um, cannot push him in, mm. in, in the same way. So, um, yeah, sometimes it's, 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 it's beneficial for, for the agents because they have so much influence and so much power mm. in, in certain uh, clubs or, or with certain, certain players. Um, but I think a lot of clubs want to um, get rid a little bit of yeah. those type of relationships mm. uh, because now good players are also everywhere. Mm. I think before, because of um, the industry having less agents, um, the super agents controlled almost everything mm. and right. everywhere. Yeah. But now having more agents uh, um, in the game, um, I think clubs are also more like, okay, if he's with another agent, also fine. Yeah. So they don't control um, mm. the industry that much anymore. Uh, anymore. So it almost goes back to Key's point before where someone like uh, one of the super agents, for every Pogba, they've got the resources to go and find the next Pogba. Yeah. So they would have both, uh, both yeah. ends. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Understood. So, Understood. Uh, so yeah, for... For some agents, it can be mm. very, very beneficial, but um, in the end, it all flats out, uh, uh, I would say. So, uh, yeah. Okay, fantastic. Um, look, that, that's kind of all the, all the questions I, I, I had for you. Um, anything from yourself, Key? I've got, I've got one. I've got yeah. two. I've yeah. got two, I've got two. So the first one is kind of around, we had International Mental Health, uh, Men's Health Day, mm. or Men's Day, International Men's, Men's, Day, Men's Day, Day, sorry. Um, and as you know, there's a big focus around men's mental health and, and as we know, what kind of comes with football in terms of the ups and downs and the release and stuff like that. Do you feel, as time's gone on, clubs and agents are doing a lot more to support players with that journey of becoming a professional footballer or not becoming a professional footballer? Do you feel that's improved or...? Or it needs improving? Um, as as football has been growing, it has improved. But mm. I think we can do much, much more mm. uh, for for football players and 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 certainly for for young football players. Yeah. Um, because with the platform a lot of players have, there is also a lot of things that come with that um, in a negative way. Mm. Um, as you can see also, some players like deactivating their uh, Instagram accounts or TikTok accounts or, yeah. or, or Facebook just because of the, the hatred they get yeah. towards them and the negative comments yeah. or sometimes racist comments yeah. um, that get to them. It's just at, a, at an all-time high. And I think um, in the football industry, we, we should protect those players even more. Yeah. Um, I, don't, I don't feel like we're doing enough uh, at this point. And also for for younger players, um, mm. because you can be in a in a playing in a in a top team yeah. at, a, at a youth level, but for some reason through injury or or whatsoever, you cannot make that final push to 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 the first team, and then yeah. you have to go somewhere else. And for a lot of players, we don't we, like they don't speak enough about that route. Also, yeah. like what will happen after that. Because yeah. as a 10-year-old or 11-year-old, imagine you go into the academy of, of Arsenal, I would say, yeah. and that's all you've been knowing for six, seven, eight years, and then you get released, and then a lot of players are like, now what? Yeah. yeah. Um, what should I do? Mm. Um, and then they lose a little bit of the confidence if they have to drop down, yeah. and it's, it's weighing on their mental health also. Yeah. And I think in terms of stuff like that, they could do more. Yeah. yeah. And now with social media, uh, you know, again, 
you're seeing some of your club mates, they're progressing. You're seeing, uh, yeah. you know, mm. the lifestyle that football is yeah. giving them, etc. So a lot of the impact of that is a bit more heightened yeah. and all that kind of stuff. And just to add on to that, you, you know, talk about mental health, etc. One of the side of the game that maybe isn't talked about as much from maybe an agent's point of view is also sort of dealing with clubs when things are not going well, right? So inevitably, we've talked about uh, how you advise players, transfers, contracts. If you're talking about contracts and transfers, that's ne- that's usually positive because someone else wants to play or, yeah. Yeah. or a contract's been offered. But actually, in terms of dealing with clubs in general, again, are you finding that is changing as they're looking for slightly different things? Or again, it's just a club-by-club club, uh, basis. I know we've talked about um, some interesting dealings you've had with with clubs in the uh, in the past, but you know that can also have an impact on the player. You know, not in the team or the club doesn't want them. Or, so, how are you finding dealing with clubs? Is that changing? Is it getting better? Is it getting worse? As some of the shifts you mentioned earlier are happening, um, I think um, it has become a little bit more um, aggressive at, at times. How mm. clubs can deal with players when things are not going well. Yeah, yeah. Um, in the way they try to force them out mm. or just to make their, their lives miserable. Yeah. Um, I've heard a lot of stories, for example, in uh, Turkey, yeah. uh, um, where they would like really make hell out of your life mm. uh, in, in, in order to for you to terminate your, your contract. Wow. So um, I think that definitely has, has been changing a little bit because everyone wants to profit from a situation in in their way. Yeah. The player, um, his camp with the agent yeah. and then the club. Yeah. So when it's going well, um, yeah, the, the club wants to earn on that and the yeah. player wants to earn on that. Yeah. But when it's going bad, it's mostly on, on the case of the club because the player's on his contract and if he really says like, I'm just going to stay here. You have to pay him. And, and you have to pay him. Mm. It's as simple as that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but now, because we're speaking about a lot of money, clubs are like, no, you cannot just stay here. But like on paper, they can. Yeah. So then they'll search for other ways to make your life miserable. So you'll be like, oh, no, I'm not. Mm. I'm not staying here. You're staying away from the first team. You've got <laughs> training ground. All this yeah. humiliation, eat, basically. Yeah. Eat in the canteen. Yeah, and, yeah. yeah. We've, yeah. Seen, and we've seen all of that. And, and, and that's... They see that Chelsea. I'm not picking on Chelsea, but but where they sign so many players on some of those contracts, we're gonna see every type of scenario come out of there, mm-hmm. yeah. you know. And if someone wants to sit on that seven or eight year contract, fair play. It's, it's, yeah. it's gonna be interesting. And they kind of touching on like where you saying clubs are being aggressive and or, or or more protective of the, for themselves. Have you seen any new clauses that a lot of clubs are implementing into the contracts mm-hmm. that you hadn't seen before or seen for a while or never seen? You know. Um, no, not not specifically. I really? think yeah, oh. I think clubs have been uh, um trying to protect them them themselves for a for a longer time. time. But now there's more air around it, mm. so we get to hear more about those type right. of treatments mm. and and stuff that has been happening. Um, but even before, even if I speak with uh the old generation, um, there are some players that have been in the same. Uh, circumstance or same situation yeah. but we just don't hear yeah. about it because... and again not to pick on Chelsea but was it Cause, <laughs> no because every time I think of an example so like Winston, was it Winston Burger? yeah yeah and those times I think it was widely reported and they get these numbers are never accurate he was on 60k a week but at that time that was, that was money. big money <laughs> yeah and then I can't remember which coach he came in I think it was I might have been, was it Claudio Rennie I can't remember someone came and said you know my plans yeah. and he said oh yeah all right, I'm not getting anywhere. I'm staying right here. <laughs> and the media here had a go at him. Or, we, have a, we have a lot of um, moral grandstanding in yeah. UK, in my opinion. Oh, it's not right. If you really love the game, he'd go and play, blah, yeah, blah, yeah. blah. And he stayed. Oh, there's no loyalty. With the kids, it's that for one, yeah. And he stayed every day. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> it's his right. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's his right. Yeah, yeah I agree. I'm surprised to hear that because uh, maybe employment law or something has yeah. something to do with it, but I would imagine that, you know, if I gave you an eight-year contract, you might try and put a clause in that says, well, after this period, we can compensation for to determine this contract is X amount, amount yeah. or whatever. But I guess the problem with that, it goes both ways, right? Yeah. So if you put any kind of notice period or whatever, that means the, the player could exercise that as well, which they don't want. Yeah. So, exactly. Yeah. Because yeah. now even with uh, with the case of uh, La Sandiara, I think that yeah. Came, yeah. came back again. Yeah. 
a lot of clubs are afraid because imagine that that he will win that case. Yeah. That means that players from now on can can buy their freedom. Yeah. yeah. And and what then? Yeah. <laughs> well, in almost every other job, you can do that anyway. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Very true. So, so yeah. yeah, it's gonna be interesting. Very very. So I guess all of those kind of developments you have to keep an eye on. Yeah. To see yeah. if it, you know, again, you can What will happen, it. how yeah. it will influence the market and yeah. players and contracts. Mm. So, uh, yeah, it's interesting. Football keeps on developing so, so fast. And so let's see what will happen in the next coming weeks, months and, and years. Mm. And I think my last question, or not I think, my last question is, <laughs> <laughs> can you give us three players that we are not aware of that's going to come out of Belgium and be superstars? <laughs> Or Pressure <laughs> that you well, may know is it to the ground? He's yeah, probably he's got, got a day, database. Yeah, he's got a database. <laughs> that's it. You might know a free players, or not even just Belgium, just across England keep, that we are, we're not yeah to look out for. Um, Wait, just one or two. Yeah, one player that I definitely found found special is um Costas Caretas from uh, Genk. Okay. Um. Born in 2007, mm-hmm. uh, left footed, playing as a number 10 or right winger. Okay. Um, this kid is, is, he's the truth. Uh, yeah. 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 Uh, I really, really, really like him. He has been playing in the first team already this year and even last year. Okay. He's 16 okay. year old. Um, so he's one of the players that um, I think that if he can be spared of injuries and yeah. just can keep his focus and his feet on the ground, he could come very, very, very far. I think um, I found him. Yeah. I'll keep an eye out for him. So this is this is a possible exclusive, yeah? Mm. Okay. Yeah. I'll find He's out. heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> These guys are going to go and play football manager. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, That's it. it. I'll, try it. I'll try to sign him. Well, look, um, um, I think, I think uh, again, because of the time we've kind of come to the end of the podcast, William, thank you so much for your Thanks. time. Thank yeah, you. Thank sharing you your, we could have gone on for a lot longer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and yeah, again, we, we'll do this again. Yeah, uh, I'll maybe come back. Le- yeah, maybe later in the season where, when a few more things have transpired, it would be good to get to get your view. Um, so, so just we- a quick one. Do you get an international break? Like, I know we're coming to the end of it, <laughs> but like, do, do you take like, maybe like a couple of days off or are you just on when international um, break is happening? Not even for international break because uh, one of my players um, played for Belgium at United under 19 oh, okay. um, in Bulgaria uh, against England also. Um, so I went to two of the three games in, uh, mm-hmm. in Bulgaria. So constant. Uh, so yeah, because for him, for example, his parents couldn't come to, to Bulgaria right. also mm. because it's during the week mm. and they are working. Mm. Um, and... Um, yeah, he was like, oh, because he laughs if 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 me or his dad or his mom is at the game, it gives him like a boost, a, a mm. supportive feeling. And then the mom called me and she was like, oh, can maybe you not go to Bulgaria and watch his games? <laughs> yeah. And I have a very good relationship with him also. Oh, okay. um, so now I was like, yeah, just just go and, and, and support him. Yeah, people um, appreciate the effort. Yeah, yeah of course. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, so it depends a little bit, <laughs> but mostly the, the the vacation or the breaks are just after the transfer market okay. because right. then all the clubs, all the directors, all the scouts are exhausted from from the weeks and and the months uh, uh, before. Um, and then I would say the first months after uh, the transfer window is like calm. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Like, oh, you're just waiting holiday. for Feb- February. You're waiting for February. Yeah, for February. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and, and then in March, about yeah. and September, yeah. those are the golden months. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those are the months where everyone is off, everyone is like calm, yeah. just nothing going on. Uh, and then a lot of people go on vacations or take, yeah. take breaks. Okay. Oh, wow. Cool. Yeah. Well, it's, it's good to, to know you get some downtime. We had a, a friend of ours who's uh, also an agent in the UK. Yeah, and he, he pretty much said the same. And uh, whenever I call him to say, oh, when he come back on, he said, after the window. After the window. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah. But again, thanks so much for coming on. Appreciate no, your appreciate time. You guys. Thank you so much. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll circle back <laughs> later, later in the season yeah. uh, and see how things are going for you. No, oh, that's, that's amazing. Yeah. That's Thank it. you. Thank uh, as always, guys, please uh, remember to uh, like, share, subscribe, tell a friend, to tell a friend, and we'll be back with another episode. Yeah. Cheers. Peace. Peace.